Okay, so thank you to coming to this workshop. It, okay. no? So, oh, missed the first one. Okay, the agenda of this workshop is <coughs> just an introduction to continuous integration, and then we will implement into, uh, continuous integration in studying Jenkins, understanding best practices for Jenkins, creating a build job. Uh, using Jenkins plugins, you will install plugins and configure them. And we then can consider everything around and beyond continuous integration and answer all your questions. So, continuous integration, what is it? What is it? If you look at the Martin Fowler definition of if you read Ken Beck uh, books, uh, it's about integrating your code as often as possible, at least daily, so that integration is a non-event and is not anymore uh, a date in your project where you try to put all the code together to something that works. You do it as an iterative process. And you have developer to stay in synchronization with the main branch of your code, not wait for weeks or months to upgrade. Nowadays, CI is a common practice, so there is a modern definition. Uh, CI is uh, about automating all your build, test, and more process, uh, so that you can run it uh, very often if possible, for each commit to detect any bug, any regression that you introduced in the software. So this is not just about building or unit testing, it's also integration testing, UI testing, QA, and so on. And uh, for such automation, you need help for other tools, especially for quality analysis. Uh, and that's also a way to find regression. If you introduced bad, pra bad development practices, you want to know it as early as possible, not in a few months when you have your sonar to warn you uh, about some synchronization issue. You want to be notified a few minutes or a few hours after the commit occurred. The benefits of running continuous integration uh, is to detect faster any regression you introduced and to fix it quickly as you still have the development, the item in mind. Uh, Jenkins can, be, uh, can use all your computing capabilities thanks to master-slave delegation, um, <clears throat> and especially as it's an automated service, it won't forget anything on your build screen on your test, on what you define as a way to validate your code. So your, your source code repository will become more stable. It will, Jenkins can warn developer as quickly as possible when something wrong occurs. Um, you will quickly point to the cause of a regression. You at least know which commit introduced it, so you can maybe just revert it or on at least analyze the, uh, the diff with the last stable state. <clears throat> and uh, it occurs a few minutes after the commit. So the guy that did the commit is still working on the ETM. He didn't switch to a completely different task. So, so when uh, continuous integration practice was introduced in external programming, it was mostly so not inside, inside the chocolate, but today automation and all the continuous stuff is really the, the large bunch of nuts you have in the benefit bar. Concretely, how will we implement this process? We will need to automate what we will call the build, but consider it in large term, build, to compile, package, test, deploy, analyze, whatever. <clears throat> and uh, we will do that during the workshop. 
And uh, one thing you have to keep in mind is, is that any test that you don't automate uh, will, by definition, miss the continuous benefits. So you have to find the adequate tooling, the adequate design, so that you can automate at, as much as possible every uh, validation of your, every variation of commits that are pushed to your, to your software. And for sure, you repeat that for everything you do in your, in your software, in your project. And when you reach this stage, you can start improving globally your, your build process by including other modules, including dependency, including deployment, including more advanced testing, for example, including, include performance testing, and UI and feature functional testing and so on and so on and so on. There is really room uh, for many, many automation to uh, improve your testing capability and your validation capability. So this, um, most of this workshop is an abridged version of the CloudBees training that we provide for Jenkins. So um, if you think you're a Jenkins power user, it's probably not necessarily for you, but there may be some things that uh, in, best, in best practice that we might cover that uh, might be of interest to you. So um, if we introduce Jenkins, uh, if you haven't already gathered, we've got Mr. Jenkins himself, an open source project, and it's based off of Java. Um, and it's fairly popular. I think uh, this conference is a testament to how popular it is. And we've got quite a number of different companies uh, using it. And um, if you aren't sure, clear exactly what makes Jenkins so great, and that's why you're at this conference. Um, it's got ease of use. It's got a massive collection of plugins. Um, it's got fairly decent reporting facilities, and it allows you to produce distributed builds. Um, if I'm going too fast, uh, let me know. If my Irish accent is throwing you off, it's the correct pronunciation of English. Don't care what those guys on the other side of the Irish Sea think about how it's pronounced. They messed up. All right, so um, installing Jenkins. So you want to um, install it and you want to configure it. Um, so there's a number of different ways to install it. The first way is you can just download the Jenkins WAR file from the website and you can either run that as a standalone application or run it as a servlet container. Um, and there's also install packages. Now Jenkins, um, when it had its old name, um, or rather, when the new name hadn't been discovered yet, as I prefer to say it, um, it was actually pretty much the inventor of the executable WAR format. So, um, uh, well, it discovered Windstone, which was the inventor of it, but um, it was the first major application to use it. Um, so you can just download it and run it with Java. So you can run it from the command line. You can, in the very small writing in non-bold font on black, with white on black, that readability uh, tells us is not very good on a projector. See, Java minus jar, Jenkins at war, and in that case, we're specifying a port. Um, there's a whole load of command line options that it gives you, that, and it gives you nice features. You can also, um, so running as a standalone app, you've got things like controlling the context path for a reverse proxy, uh, the listen address, log file, certificate, whether it's a daemon or not, and how to respond to sig 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 to signals. Um, given the way a lot of the hipsters are moving, actually running Jenkins as a standalone app is probably the way a lot of these uh, things would go. People tend now to be favoring more having a built-in um, uh, servlet container in your application and running that on its own so that you can just manage its garbage collection on its own rather than having 10 big applications share the same servlet container. That works just as well, but you need to know how to tune the servlet container and how to tune the servlet container for the 10 different applications that are running in it. Um, you can, as well, deploy it to an existing application server. Um, that might fit with your infrastructure better. Um, it may be that having 10 different JVMs, which have spiky nature in memory, might suit better to, to you than having 10 uh, separate JVMs running all the time, or maybe you want to manage that memory yourself. So you can just take the Jenkins WAR file and push it into your 
web apps directory in your Tomcat or um, whatever. Um, if you want to install it in Linux, there's packages. For example, with Red Hat, you just four commands and there you go. With Ubuntu, it's one command, apt get Jenkins. Um, so with the native packages, you get a much more consistent experience in terms of, yeah? With updates on Jenkins with um, the native packaging. Yeah, it's part of the thing, but it normally it depends which release line you've installed. So if you install the tip, you'll get updates on the tip. If you install the LTS, you'll get updates on the LTS. Um, the Ubuntu packaging that you get with APT get by default, my understanding is that's the latest LTS. So you're on the LTS branch rather than being on the tip, which you might not want to be. Um, so you get it integrated into the way that the system administrator will be expecting a application to be integrated. So that can be handy, whereas running it as an executable WAR file, you don't get the logs where you want them, you don't get all these things. You know where they are, but you just don't get them where you want them. If you're one of the poor unfortunates who happens to have to run Windows, there is also um, the setup XE and uh, it, that will install Windows uh, as a Windows service. Um, you can then, for updating that one, you have to download the next installer and it'll update on, over it. But the only thing you want to make sure is there's a Jenkins XML file that'll get overwritten. There's also installers for Mac and Solaris. Another option is not to bother installing and managing it yourself. And here's our shameless plug. You could use uh, CloudBees Devit Cloud. And we take care of all the pain of managing Devit Cloud. We have an army of uh, selfless developers who live in Australia that we get them to do all the work and we get them to keep, stay awake 24 hours so that we don't have to do anything. Um, so, when you start Jenkins, you'll get something a bit like this. Um, and you're like, wow, that's great, yeah. So, you'll need to configure it. Sorry, there, there's some work you've got to do. Um, it's no good just saying, yeah, we installed Jenkins. Where are the jobs? No, did you configure it? No, no. So, um, there's managing Jenkins. It uh, gives you a lot of options for configuring. Um, you've got configure system, which is your general system configuration. You can up install or update plugins. This is great, you know, get yourself, there's 535, or at least there was yesterday evening, 535 plugins in the open source update center. You can install every one of those if you want and uh, play the game. How many have you installed? Oh, you've only installed 53. We have 74. Um, there's environment details for figuring out if there's something going wrong. You can have a look at the load statistics and measure how busy your server is. Oh, you only have 15 builds per hour. We have 73. Um, you have uh, the ability to manage distributed build uh, nodes um, so that you can basically farm out um, builds onto multiple slaves. Um, oftentimes, running builds on slaves is the way you want to go to. When people get started with Jenkins, they'll start running builds on the master. After a while, they're going to want to run builds exclusively on the slaves and not on the master. When you're getting running, starting off build, running builds on the master is fine, but once you've actually got there, you want to start migrating them over onto slaves because they're a lot more amenable to scaling out and to scaling your system and handling loads and you've got a decent separation of concern in terms of what resources are running builds versus what resources are for actually serving the users of your application. Another thing to keep in mind is sometimes you might actually just set up the slaves on the same machine as the master, but just manage them as a slave. That allows other tricks that people can use. Um, you can also install things like the disk usage plugin that will tell you how much disk, how the disk usage is going. It's nice having this system that goes and sends you emails when the build is broken and all the developers get into a state where they basically are all the time committing code that always works because they're in the habit of writing code that works and they're in the habit of writing code that doesn't have bugs and because Jenkins will email them and give out and everything's going along fine and smoothly and the server runs out of disk space and uh, suddenly everything's broken and no one knows why. 
with things like a disk usage plugin, you can keep a handle on that and make sure that you're aware what your disk usage is and when you're getting near the point where you need to go to your manager and say, give me more disks. Um, you also have the Jenkins user database over on the side. Um, Jenkins can associate all sorts of useful information with the users. So you've got, say for example, the user's source control identifier, you can associate a real name with that person. With the things like the credentials plugin, you can associate um, their passwords for various servers or their SSL certs so that Jenkins can do things on their behalf as them rather than being restricted to doing things as itself. So um, with system configuration, you can configure many aspects. You've got security, which initially is off to allow you to configure the system. Um, and then you turn it on when you're ready to lock it down. The JDK installations, build tools, Ant and Maven installations. I should point out Jenkins is not just for Java and not just for Ant and Maven. Um, there's a lot of people use Jenkins for other build tools, but being as it's written in Java, we have to have very nice support for Java. And that's not saying that there isn't nice support for other build tools, it's just saying that we're Java, so we have to have support for Java, we'd be given out to if we didn't. Um, there's integration for version control tools, email, and then each plugin has the opportunity to add in its own specific system configuration elements that you might want to configure there. One concept that you need to kind of be aware of is what is an executor. So it's basically a way of dividing up the build server or the build slave into units that are able to run builds. So you may have a build which is not CPU com uh, compute intensive. That would use up one executor. You may have a build which is CPU intensive, but RAM light, that would use up a build executor. So typically you'd set it to, to something like the number of cores. That's not saying that you haven't got a build that's going to use all four cores on your four core machine and the other three builds that are running on that machine at the same time uh, are gonna be starved for CPU. It's just we've got to divide it up somehow. So um, the big thing that you tend to get caught on is memory requirements. Using more CPU, unless you've got performance tests in your build jobs, isn't a big issue. It just means the build will take a bit longer because you've four jobs that want all four cores and they're all running at the same time, the build is gonna take longer. But um, if you've four builds and they all use four gigs of RAM and you've only eight gigs of RAM on your server, even, with, uh, even when you've got virtual disk, the disk is gonna get trashed, but two of those jobs are gonna fail because there isn't enough RAM. So memory is the thing that you really need to scale. So if you know how much memory your builds use, um, that can give you an idea of how much memory, you, how many executors you really have. That's the first critical breakpoint. So um, with uh, Jenkins, one of the things that KK really likes to do is to make things as easy as possible to do. So it used to be a pain when, if you started using Jenkins originally back like I did in the low to mid uh, number of releases after he actually let the so uh, source code out of Sun, um, you had to install your own JDK. Now you can just go and you can say, I want this specific JDK version and it'll go and download it for you from Sun or Oracle, um, everything gets renamed. Uh, and um, it will install it automatically for you in the build save, and it'll always be there. Um, you don't have to download it that way. You may have a custom build of the JRE or JDK that you want, and you might just package it up as a zip file, or you may have some other command that you want for getting things in, but there's me mechanisms for doing that, and once you use those, you've actually got your installation in place. So you can download from the Oracle website, um, or use your local zip or targz or whatever. Um, so that's kind of the system configuration, but we need to look as to how does your Jenkins instance fit in with the rest of your ecosystem. Um, you want a good URL for your Jenkins server. 
yeah, that's the URL you got originally when you got your server. Um, that was the desktop machine that the guy who quit left and IT haven't managed to claim back and you've stuck it under your desk and nobody's asked for it back. Yes. Um, nobody's going to find that one. That one they're going to find. So you can use things like a CNAME or anything, uh, various different mechanisms. Make that the URL that people use. Not necessarily with CloudBees sticking in your own company name, but uh, you won't get that CNAME. We have it. Uh, but make Make it so that it's the root URL and the default port so that people can just type it in. Makes it easy for people to find it. You can share port 80 with other applications. So you can use Apache, you can use IIS with URL rewrite and application request routing. Um, and that will allow you to run it. It also allows you to run Jenkins non-root. Don't stick slash Jenkins in the path. Hide it so that it looks like it's Jenkins dot whatever. Um, you can run them on the same server. You can have Redmine and Jenkins both on the same server, but by using um, the location information, when you access Jenkins, you get Jenkins. When you access Redmine, you get Redmine. Um, it's far easier when down the road your Jenkins server or your Redmine instance gets too big for um, the server to live with the other one. For example, you're fixing loads of bugs, uh, or you've loads of bugs that you're not fixing because you're not running, using your Jenkins instance as much. Redmine gets too big, you have to move it onto a different server. Or you've got loads and loads of builds with, all your, with no bugs. Jenkins gets too big, and it needs to be moved onto a separate server. Uh, in either of those two cases, if you've got it this way, you can redirect it, and nobody need know that you've changed your infrastructure behind. You will want to prepare for using up more and more and more disk space. Um, as you get more and more jobs, as Jenkins becomes more infectious in your organization, um, you will need more disks at it. Don't worry about them being fast. You just want them to be ones that are big, and you want to make sure you're on a file system that can grow. So on Linux, it helps if you're on an LVM-based file system, because you can grow the LVM and you can extend the file system on that point. On Windows, there's other tricks you can use as well. But you want to make sure that when you're planning your install that you've planned for the possibility that this is going to hit you in the end. There are tricks you can do. You can not keep every build. Eventually, there will be certain builds you have to keep that enough of them grow, and you use up the disk space that you'd planned for. So plan in advance that you can grow. At this point, um, the next stage is dealing with Jenkins build jobs. So you've got your Jenkins instance, and now you want to do something with it. So in Jenkins, typically, the way to do that is you can create your build jobs, and then they're what the chunks of work that will uh, get built. Now, it's a particular execution of an automated script. You may find that a project has several jobs. There's nothing wrong with having a project with 20 or 30 jobs, or having one job per project, just whatever way works for you. Um, but typically, you're going to have a couple of jobs. So you've got your killer app project, and it has, and you've got your pet store projects. You've probably got a unit test build job. You've probably got an integration test build job. You might have a reporting build job. You're going to have pretty much the same set over on the pet store project. So you're going to end up with those. Now, if you use the shameless plug uh, CloudBees folders plugin, you can basically have a folder for the killer app project and a folder for the pet store project and just create the three build jobs in there. And if you're really dancing around, you could use the CloudBees templates plugin to go and create those uh, off a standard template. But that's not what we're dealing with here. We're just looking at vanilla Jenkins. So. The way you do is you go to the new job menu item, and then you get this nice screen which shows you the list of the different build jobs. So you've got your freestyle software project, which is um, allows you to build anything. And I'm going to point out 
KK isn't in the room, so I'm going to point out the freestyle can also be used to build Maven projects. <laughs> There's the uh, Maven 2 tree project type, which can also not be used. Um, <laughs> Uh, and there's the multi-configuration project, um, which allows you to build a matrix, and there's the monitor an external job, which allows you to take something that you don't want to move into Jenkins yet, but still report it and monitor it from your Jenkins instance. So maybe there's a cron task that you have that deploys your code into production, and you don't want to put that into Jenkins, but you want to be able to report on it, so you get the cron task as part of its job, to send notification onto the air monitor and external job so that you can see the cron tab running all the time. Um, for anyone who doesn't know about my complaints about the Maven 2, Maven 3 project type, since 2007, KK and I have had a disagreement over that particular project type, but um, <laughs> we haven't resolved that disagreement yet. <laughs> so I bash it every chance he gets, he bashes me every chance he gets. So, you've got monitoring external jobs and general purpose jobs. So, the freestyle job is the most flexible. You can build any type of project, including Maven. Um, it works with all the reporting plugins. However, the downside is, because it's so flexible, you have more work to do to configure it. The Maven 2 job type um, reads the POM file. Um, it infers a number of things and it will build projects based on the Maven dependencies. It has an understanding of the multi-module projects, but there are certain things that it does which aren't quite the Maven way, and if I change my hat, um, that's why I disagree with it, because I'm also on the Maven project, um, and I would say it works 95, 99% of the time, but there's 1% of the time for certain strange usages of Maven or for certain ways of doing things when it will just blow up in your face and you have to go back to the freestyle. So um, I never use that type except when I'm dealing with support issues for CloudBees. <laughs> um, so today we're going to go with setting up freestyle build jobs. Um, the full training pack that we normally do also covers the Maven 2 project type. And if I'm delivering it, you get a nice extra bonus half hour of me bashing the Maven 2 project type included. Uh, so the freestyle job, um, you get all these. You basically click on new job. You give it a name. You choose the freestyle project. You get 10 brownie points from me. You configure your project by uh, filling in the various options. So you've got... Um, the general information about the freestyle job. You've got the name, you've got a description. What a lot of people don't realize initially is the description can, can include HTML. So you can often include links to other things in that description. Um, at a previous employers, what we do is we'd include a link to the wiki page for that particular project and a link to the, what was it? Clear Quest or some really annoying uh, bug tracking system that we had to use. Uh, um, we had a link to that, to a, a query that would give you a list of all the bugs on that particular project. So there's all sorts of things you can use with that description tag. Um, you've also got the option to throw away old builds, which can be quite handy. You've got... Um, uh, if you want the build to stop and to not work, uh, to not be on for the time being, you can disable the build. Um, I should mention we have uh, it, it's so often a pattern that people have that they want to stop a build for a short period of time, and then they forget to turn the build back on again. That we actually have a one of the CloudBees plugins that we have. It's not one of the preset. Is just a skip next build plugin. Um, which will just stop the builds for like 24 hours um, so that you don't have to remember to go back in and turn it on again. It, it's a really small little thing, but I think it's really useful. Um, so uh, in terms of the discarding old build data, it's very good when you want to try and put a cap on the amount of consumption. Um, it'll help your startup performance, and you can mark builds as important, in which case they won't be thrown away. 
So even although you've said, oh, you only want to keep 60 builds, if you mark 60 builds as important, they won't get thrown away, and it's other ones that will get thrown away, and then you can mark 63, 64, and have 90 builds that are being kept, even although you've said only keep the last 30 days and only keep 60 builds. These are important. It'll hold on to them. Um, the source control uh, configuration, that allows you to control what you're checking out. Um, out of source control and the source control system you're using. There are loads of different source control systems that have plugins. Um, and you basically just need to have the source control system that you're using, the plugin for that installed, and away you go. So the quiet period, I believe if you're using CVS, the quiet period is really important. Um, I'm lucky enough not to have any recollection of using CVS in the past four or five years, so um, I don't know <laughs> on that. But um, in general, it, the idea, I think, is that with CVS, you can have a commit storm because each file is committed independently and you have non-transactional commits. So if you have multiple changes within the quiet period, it'll wait until the quiet period is expired before committing them. And so therefore, if you've got that commit storm, you'll want the quiet period. Um, for other source control systems, you might just want to delay a couple of minutes before kicking off the, or a couple of seconds before kicking off the build. Um, then you've got the actual source control man, uh, code management. Um, where does the source code come from? Um, you can the very configuration details depend on the source control system, and you can configure a repository browser. That's really nice, and one of the good features of Jenkins is that you can have multiple systems integrated quite well. So by integrating a source control system, when you're looking at a change set in Jenkins, you can actually drill down and click on the cha individual change and see the source code diff that you've got by integrating that. And you've now got a view exactly on what the change was that probably caused the test to break. You've got your job triggers, which control how, when the build gets starts, started. Um, you can have it uh, after other builds have been uh, successfully completed. You can have it uh, triggered by a special URL, so um, our URL, uh, whatever your pronunciation of that word is, our acronym. Um, so the idea there is you could have a special URL, which um, by making a post request to it with the uh, with a pre-configured token it will trigger automatically the build. So you could have some other external system kicking off Jenkins without having to deal with user authentication. Um, you can build it periodically. Um, there are special uh, at symbol tokens like midnight and so on. If you click on that little help icon there, it will give you nice handy help about how to use it. And then there's polling of source control as well, whereby it will reach out a set period go and ask your source control system any changes since last time, and then trigger the build. I should say that after a while, when you've lots and lots of jobs, you're going to want to switch from the polling model to the push model. So it can be helpful to think about that before you start creating loads and loads of jobs. If you've gone and created loads and loads of jobs in the poll model, and you want to switch to the push model, something like the Scriptler plugin can you, you can use Groovy to go and change the configuration of all the jobs in one go from pull to push. So that can be a handy one to remember. Um, then you add in each individual bit, build step. Again, plugins can add in and do add in multiple build steps. There's many types available, um, and you can have many of them. And by using drag and drop, you can just reorder those build steps. Um, it exposes configuration and various different pieces of information as environment variables, and you can even use uh, parameterized builds in Jenkins to expose those as environment variables to tweak how your build works. So one example would be baking the build ID into your manifest. So that, um, and then post build actions is where you integrate with the reporting framework of Jenkins. So you can archive artifacts, you can capture reports, trigger other builds, send off emails, and so on. Um, typically, archiving is where you take an artifact that you've built and have Jenkins store it for you. And then you actually can retrieve those from the build page. 
So you just configure an ant style pattern like that. And then on your build screen, you'll see build artifacts there after you've got a build. You've also got JUnit reports again, so you can just turn that on, give it an ant style, and then you'll see the test result trend, and you can click on the graph to drill down and all these things. You can capture Javadoc. Um, you can have email notifications so that every time something goes wrong, you get uh, an email. It's really good um, to have it so that it sends emails only when things are broken. Otherwise, everyone just creates a filter and throws away the emails and nobody sees the fact that it's broken. Far better is to send an email only when things are broken. Trigger other builds. And we hit another exercise. All right, so I'll get to the next part. Um, um, we want to do, you know, just have people look at sort of play through um, Jenkins and uh, wanted to point people to Jenkins Enterprise, shameless plug in terms of uh, what we are building here. Um, and uh, a number of people actually came up to me and asked me about this today after I talked about templates. So there are like primarily three themes that we've gone in within Jenkins Enterprise and Jenkins Enterprise is really the CloudBees Enterprise version of Jenkins, which what it means it's building on top of um, Jenkins LTS and we are providing these uh, proprietary plugins in there. And uh, uh, we take the three month support that you get on LTS and extend that for nine more months so you have support for one year and you know you can move at a slower pace than LTS if you want. Uh, you could take all of these plugins and you know install that on the tip as well and things would work fine. The uh, themes that we sort of go after are large installation. Uh, with that, we have folders that we just sort of give, you know, gave to the community today, um, the templates and uh, backup. And we um, gave part of the backup plugin to the community, which is uh, backing up to the cloud. So with that, when you've created an account today, you can actually go back home and uh, download the plugin gateway and uh, um, connect to CloudBees and it'll start pushing your backups of your Jenkins on our system. Yeah. So that's sort of the, what we do on the large installation side of things. Then we built this fairly sophisticated role-based access control uh, plugin, which works very well with the folders and in the sense that you can now go into individual folders and apply security permissions. And so you have, you know, teams that are set based on folders and permissions based on those teams. And then you can filter roles and you can pin roles to a particular level. So you can do a, a number of things there which you can't do with the open source, uh, various open source uh, role-based access control ones. Um, the next one is fairly small, which tends to find favor with the financial firms. And what you do there is on your descriptions in the field up there, you just, instead of putting HTML, you put in wiki text to kind of get away from XSS attacks. Um, on the optimized utilization uh, stuff of things, we have this auto scaling for VMware. Uh, so if you have a vSphere installation, you just take all your machines and put in the vSphere installation and we start using all the machines there. So you can snapshot machines and start them up and sort of ends up using that as your private cloud. Um, uh, the throttle build execution and even load strategy, uh, again, they work on top of uh, um, the even load strategy plugin actually helps you sort of uh, change the order in which uh, machines get allocated for a build. So typically Jenkins goes back to the same machine and sometimes that machine is heavily loaded, but still Jenkins goes back to it even though if there's a lighter loaded machine sitting somewhere else. So this allows you to flip uh, the algorithm on that and then it goes to lightly loaded machines as opposed to going to favorable machines. Um, the most exciting ones that we've sort of, uh, we've been working on and we'll release next month and Kosuke already mentioned these two is this capability of hot standby. So you set up a Jenkins enterprise and uh, um, you can set up another Jenkins master, you start, start you know, a couple of these up and they form a cluster and they elect a primary master and once they do that, if the primary master 
you know, crashes at some point, uh, you're sort of moved over to the secondary master, which boots up and starts taking requests there. Um, so th that's one of the major things that internally Kosuke has been working on the last few months. Uh, custom update centers uh, allows you very easily to use Jenkins as your update center. So you can um, inherit from other update centers, so you can you know, have a hierarchy of these update centers and then push uh, you know, certified quote-unquote plugins to the rest of your organization. So it helps sort of managing um, your updates to the plugins much more easier than what you can do today. So that's sort of the overarching thing on Jenkins Enterprise. Um, with, uh, uh, I guess the next thing that we keep hearing in various conversations is how you can take CI and actually move to the next step with continuous deployment. So um, this is fairly easily done actually in DevOt Cloud and uh, uh, all you need to do is, one of the plugins that we released today was uh, this CloudBees Deployer plugin. We've released that in the past, but we've made significant improvements to it. So what it ends up doing is you, you, know, you define a path to an artifact that's built. It's a war file, boom, you, know, you say deploy this to a CloudBees pass and it gets pushed to, a, you know, to the CloudBees pass and you can see that working. And that's fairly seamless. Um, in terms of a demo, we were actually going to show, uh, there's an end-to-end tutorial app that's sitting up there that we were originally going to use for this uh, 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 class. But you can go through the the end-to-end -end tutorial and you can see that it's just a matter of going to the Jenkins configuration and selecting deploy this on your CloudBees account and you can just uh, deploy it at that point. With that, I think we'll come down to sort of closing stuff today. Um, well, you already know about JenkinsCI.org. Um, and here are various CloudBees resources in terms of what we do. The stuff that Stephen taught today, usually Kesik, uh, Kosuke uh, uses that as training material and covers that in a day training that he does. And then there's support with, with people like Nicola on board and this Jenkins Enterprise and CloudBees Devit Cloud. The end-to-end -end sample that I was talking to you about sits at that URL. So with that, uh, thank you very much for coming here and sitting through. I hope this was useful for you guys.